Hey everybody, this is Erica, the technology nerd likes to film stuff. Alas, we are reaching the end of the year of all the smartphones that are being released. And late to the game has been the LG V10, which I have gotten several weeks ago and I've really been faithful in using this as my daily driver. So I want to give this a review, talk about how I feel about it. This phone is not really an LG G4. It's not really a Galaxy Note 5, but it is a really great phone for the power user and also for its multimedia experience, such as taking video or taking pictures. I'm actually quite impressed with this phone. It's been really a good experience, so I want to tell you the goods and the bads, maybe some of the uglies, help you decide if this is the device for you. Who knows, maybe you'll start to regret the LG G4 that you had gotten this year, which was a great phone as well. I really liked the G4. So let's go ahead and talk about it and see if it deserves a place in your pocket. So this phone is absolutely huge. You can see right next to my face. Granted, I am a small person. I know a lot of you already know that and don't want to hear it, but yes, I am small. You can see this is very, very big, a very, very big phone. It is not the absolute biggest phone that I've ever seen on the market, but it does certainly match the likes of the Nexus 6P that has come out recently. But no matter, this feels really nice and solid in the hand. This is actually probably my favorite phone to hold this year. Yes, phones that are full aluminum feel very nice to hold. Yes, phones that have glass on the back feel nice to hold, but this just has a feel of security to it. So we've got these steel rails on the side, which really helps with durability. And we've also got this backing that is kind of like a silicone plasticky as well. So it does not feel like I'm going to drop it and that curved design that it has just really cups my hand very nicely. So it's really a joy to hold. So now let's take a little bit of a look around the phone. Let's start with the back. So on the back, we have a 16 megapixel camera. This is the same optics that we had on the LG G4. So at 1.8 aperture lens, we also have optical image stabilization. And then you also have the dual LED flash and you also have the laser for the laser autofocus as well. Then you have your volume buttons on the back as well as the power button, which also doubles as your fingerprint sensor. Then you can remove that back cover and underneath you reveal the 3000 milliamp hour battery, which is user removable. And we also have an SD card slot. So that is something impressive because we don't really see that these days. Then on the right side of the phone, you don't have anything but that nice steel rail. Same thing for the left side of the phone. So it's very clean and understated. On the top of the phone, we have a microphone and an IR blaster. On the bottom of the phone, you have your speaker, you have a microphone and also your standard headphone jack. Then on the front, you have your receiver, you have your proximity sensor, ambient light sensor. Then you have your 5.7 inch display. And then you also have a secondary display, which we will talk about. That's a 2.1 inch display. And then to the left of that, you have two cameras. They're five megapixels a piece. One is an 80 degree camera and the other one is 120 degree camera for extra wide angle selfies. Now the material on the front is this really nice soft touch material. It feels really nice in the hand. This whole phone feels really nice. It's not all aluminum and it's not all glass, but it does have a nice grippy industrial feeling that is quite premium to me. And from what I can see, this guy can withstand some drops. So specs, what about specs on this phone and how about the performance? So we have the Snapdragon 808 SoC inside of this. It's got a hexa-core CPU. So we have two cores. Those are the higher powered cores, 857s, which are clocked at 1.82 gigahertz. And then we also have four cores, which are lower powered cores, 853s, which are clocked at 1.44 gigahertz. We've got the Adreno 418 GPU, four gigabytes of RAM. So that is up from the three gigabytes from the LG G4. We also have 64 gigabytes of internal storage. That is the only option that this phone comes in, which is really nice because with the G4, you had a 32 and a 64 gigabyte option. So woohoo, not only do you have 64 gigabytes of internal storage as the standard for this phone, you also have an SD card slot. Now, as the LG aims this as a multimedia phone, you're not gonna have any issues running out of storage for video and also if you wanna store some of that video or whatever else on an SD card. So this really is a rarity on the market, I believe. Now, looking at some of the performance aspects of this phone, this is not the most powerful phone out there. Now, we don't have a Snapdragon 810 SoC inside of this. This is the S808. When running it against some other phones like the Nexus 6P, which has the Snapdragon 810 SoC inside of it, you can see that it doesn't score as well on the benchmark side for the CPU or the GPU side. 
But I have to say that this is a very nice and smooth device. I see that apps open nice and quickly. It's been a really fluid experience. I haven't had anything to complain about. The only time I do see a little bit of hiccup is when I hold down on the home screen and I pull up the options menu. And I see sometimes it will struggle there or sometimes if I rotate the display, there's a little bit of lag. But other than that, it's a very complete fluid experience. This thing has four gigabytes of RAM. This thing is great with multitasking. I assume they're having four gigabytes of RAM so that underneath the camera you can use all of those manual controls. Also, you have the Q slide features and you've also got their multi-window type features as well. So this phone is more than equipped to handle what you throw at it. So even though it doesn't score at the top for benchmarks, when I play games, for the most part, things look pretty smooth. When you play really graphic intensive games, you can see that it does struggle a little bit, but I've seen that with the other Snapdragon 808 devices. So it seems to play well enough, but you're not getting the most buttery smooth frame rates at all times. And honestly, I'm not playing a lot of intensive games for that to matter to me anyway. This is more of a multimedia phone rather than the top flagship SoC. But my opinion is that it's just fine. And the S808 is more than powerful enough to drive the amount of pixels that you have on the display for just general use. So what about battery life on this guy? Well, this has got a 3000 milliamp hour battery inside of it. Yes, it's removable, thankfully. So even though this is a smaller type of battery, you can carry around two and swap them. Also, this device has quick charge 2.0, so you can simply plug it in and LG quotes that it takes 50 minutes to charge 40%, but I feel like it's charging faster than that. And I feel like it charges pretty quickly. So even though the battery life is not that great on this device, it does charge very quickly and I can switch the battery out. So all those things are not so bad. If you want inductive charging, you need to buy a different back cover for it so that it has that capability. But as for screen on time, I usually keep this at about 50%. I am not using it really strenuously through the day. I have it mostly on Wi-Fi. Sometimes I go out on LTE, watch a little bit of YouTube videos. I also do a lot of social media. I take some pictures and things and I get about four hours of on-screen time. I haven't really been able to go beyond that, but I've seen that other people can as well. So I really wonder if it depends on the carrier and your signal and, and all these other things. I have to say that the battery life pretty much is just average though, but it hasn't been bothering me so much because it does charge very quickly and because you can swap out that battery. So now let's talk a little bit about the unique features on this phone, which make this phone what it is. The first thing, of course, would be that 2.1 inch secondary display. So this little display has two different modes. You have a mode for when the display is off and also one for when the display is on. When it's off, you can simply display date and time. You can also display your signature. It'll tell you what little notifications you have. And if you slide it to the left, you have access to your volume controls, Wi-Fi on and off toggle, your flashlight, and also your camera. So I find that to be nice and useful. One thing I wish that it did include with the display off is I wish we had little app shortcuts so that I could simply get into whatever app I wanted to when the display was off. That would be really, really nice to have. Once you turn on the phone, you have several options. It will show you the signature. It will show you your app shortcuts. It'll show you your recent applications, music player, quick contacts, upcoming plans. All of these can be disabled and you can also arrange the orders as well. In general, I really like this concept, although I feel that it's a little bit awkwardly placed. I can easily get to shortcuts on the home screen, for example, instead of scrolling through all the options at the top. Although one thing that I really do like about this is that you get notifications on this little display, which makes it so you don't have notifications popping up on your screen and it keeps everything seamless and without distraction. So that is really nice. If I get a text message, it shows up on that little secondary screen and doesn't obstruct my application that I'm using. So that is a feature that I really like, but honestly, most of the time I am keeping this display off. When it's on, I don't like some of the light bleed that I am seeing. So it's a nice feature, but it's not an absolute essential feature. The other cool thing that we have with this phone are those two front facing cameras, one that is 80 degrees for selfies and 120 degrees for wide angle selfies. So I've been having a lot of fun with that. And you really can get quite a wide angle for those wide angle selfies. 
I also really like that we have a variety of ways in which we can unlock the phone. You can, of course, unlock it with the fingerprint sensor, which I find to be pretty accurate, and I really like how it's placed on the back. Since playing with the Nexus 6P, I have grown to really love the fingerprint sensors that are on the back. You can still double tap to turn on your display. You still have the knock knock code ability as well. You also still have your classic features like other LG phones such as capture. You have access to cue slides so you can have your little windows for little applications floating around on the screen. You've got your dual window feature as well, kind of reminiscent of what Samsung has with their Note series of phones and even the Galaxy S6 now. So with four gigabytes of RAM, you really can benefit with the multitasking and of course, that RAM helps with all those awesome camera features, which we will talk about in the camera section, because that is really what makes this phone this phone. So now let's move on to talking about these displays, or actually one display rather, because the secondary display we have is the same panel as the 5.7 inch one. It's just being controlled independently. So what's really nice though, is that you get that really nice high pixel density on this little secondary part of the display. Now, unfortunately, it has a little bit of an issue with backlight bleeding. A lot of people are reporting the same thing, so it seems to be a constant issue. So I probably wouldn't bother exchanging it. You're probably going to get the same problem. Although some people are saying that some look worse than others. So this is an LCD panel. And if we look at the 5.7 inch portion, it's quad HD over 500 pixels per inch. And I'm really happy to see that LG did not mess up like they did with the G3. They did not over sharpen this display. So the display looks really nice in that way. The most notable thing about this display though is just how bluish greenish the white point is. So when looking at my measurements, I can see there's too much blue, there's too much green in there, and there's really just not enough red. Red is severely lacking. Also, the color temperature is very cool, nearing 8,000 Kelvin. It's something that really bothers my eyes, although your eyes will adjust to different white points, so you probably might not even notice the bluish greenish after a while until you look at other displays. It is nice that we have a really great contrast ratio with this display. It's over 1,600 to one for the contrast ratio according to my measurements. I think the viewing angles also look pretty good. Now this is a wide gamut display, so it's very wide in the greens and in the reds. This isn't going to be good for color accuracy though. All the content that we see on the internet or even the content that's just on the phone applications, the operating system is meant for the sRGB calibration standard. So everything is going to look a little off, but still some people are liking the reds on this and the greens just don't expect to be able to use this for color accuracy. The average gamma of this display is 2.31 and I'm able to look at the behavior of the display and I'm happy to see that the display isn't too contrasty looking. It's not too artificial in that way. So really for me, if it just didn't have that really bluish greenish white point, I'd be a lot happier. So how about actually using this as a phone? For me, I haven't had any issues whatsoever. Call quality has been really good. I haven't had any issues with the person hearing me on the other end. Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, GPS have all been working just fine, although I heard there were some initial bugs at the beginning, although I have not been affected by them. Down here at the bottom, we have a speaker. Now, to me, the speaker is not impressive at all, although I'm hearing different things depending on the person, so I wonder if there's some variation between the phones. For me, my speaker sounds more quiet than I'd like it to. It also sounds kind of muffled sometimes, so that's something that's been a little bit of a concern to me. I really wish it got louder. I have really not been impressed by the speaker on this phone, but where this phone really shines, and sadly where this is not really being hyped, is that this has a 32-bit ESS Sabre 9018 DAC, that's digital to analog converter, in addition to the onboard Snapdragon one, and also a Sabre 9602 headphone amplifier, so you can toggle this setting on and off. It can be turned on and off to save battery life, and also the layman is really not going to know what this is, so it's just off by default. So you can play high fidelity audio on this phone, of course, with the right headphones that can tell a difference. So audio files are rejoicing over the low noise floor due to the careful design of the phone, also low total harmonic distortion. It also has a neutral sound signature, flat. It is being described to have a wider sound stage, better sound clarity and reproduction than with the hi-fi setting off or even compared to the LG G4. I see audio files raving about being impressed with the sound quality from a phone and comparing it to their digital audio players. So it looks like for audio files, this is the phone to have if you care about playing your lossless music files or streaming high fidelity audio. Unfortunately, not all applications work, but the stock app does from LG, so you can load your files onto here. 
Also, streaming services like Tidal do work. So you can stream hi-fi music from there. And also, there's a little workaround that people are figuring out how to do using the Neko Atsume app. So that's if you want to get the DAC working for third-party applications. I'm going to put a link in the description so that you can find out all this stuff. I am not an audiophile, but I just wanted to pay some nice homage to what LG has done here. I really hope that LG gets this DAC working all over the phone universally instead of just in some places. Until then, this is kind of sounds frustrating to me. So again, check out the link in the description where this is just blown up in audiophile threads. So good job, LG. This really is a multimedia phone. So lastly, in this review, I want to talk about the camera. I want to go through the interface, and I also want to show you some video and picture examples. So this is a 16 megapixel camera. It's got the same optics as the LG G4, 1.8 aperture lens, optical image stabilized lens. We also have a dual LED flash, and there's the laser to help with the laser autofocus. And fortunately, on this little lens ring that we have here, you can see that the anodized aluminum is wearing. The color is coming off. That's only been happening from putting it in and out of my pocket and from sitting it down on the table. But I haven't done anything overly aggressive with it, so I'm surprised to see it wearing like this. So that is a bit of a bummer. So now let's take a little bit of a look at the camera interface. This is the best camera interface that I have seen so far. It's very, very intuitive. You've got a lot of automatic controls. Here you have the secondary display here, which houses some of the controls, so everything stays uncluttered and easy to access. So here's the simple mode, which just simply lets you take pictures very, very quickly. You don't have access to video controls right here, but you do have access to the front-facing cameras. Otherwise, for simple controls, when the display is off, you can double tap on the bottom volume button, and you can see it opens the camera there for you as well. Next, you have your automatic mode. Here you can have access to video. So here you have flash, you can turn to the front facing camera, you have mode, which has a couple options, automatic, you've got multi view, which is going to let you use the different camera views. So you see there are several options and you can switch between cameras by sliding here. You have access to panorama, slow motion, which is 120 frames per second at 1080p and also time lapse. Now under settings, you have access to HDR. This is the only mode where you're going to be able to access HDR. Here you can choose your picture aspect and also you can choose between 4K, 1080p for video, or just 720p. You have some voice controls. Here you have timer and also you can decide to put the grid so you can compose your video or your pictures. Here you have the option to choose between optical image stabilization or steady. If you want to use the combination of OIS and DIS, you're going to have to go down to full HD or also HD. You can't use it for 4K. This really helps to stabilize the image and video, although it does crop it a little bit. Next, you have your manual mode for pictures, which is awesome. This is what you have on the LG G4. You can control for your white balance, your manual focus, exposure compensation, ISO, shutter speed. You have the auto exposure lock. You also have a meter here. You have flash. You can use the front facing cameras. You can choose RAW or JPG. Then you have some settings. Again, you have your picture aspect. Here you have your voice controls, your timer. You can control the grid or you can turn the meter on or off. What really impresses me though is this manual mode for video. You have real-time controls for video. This is something that blew me out of the water. I was really not expecting that. So we have left and right audio monitoring. You have flash. You can turn to the front-facing camera. You can choose between steady or optical image stabilization. And you've got some settings here. So you have Ultra HD for 4K, Full HD. And then we have the Full HD cinema mode. So you're going to have a wider image, but you will get more black bars. You've got HD and also HD cinema. What I really love is being able to choose the bit rate though. So even underneath Ultra HD, I can choose to have a really high bit rate and it tells me that I'm shooting at 30 frames per second at 60 more megabits per second. Nice job, LG, very impressed. You're able to use this mode on all the different modes that we have here, even under cinema. Bit rate control is very, very awesome. Then down here at the bottom, you can control for the directivity of the microphone. Although strangely, I find when recording video, I need to direct the microphone towards the subject. If I don't, it sounds a little bit quiet for them for some reason, even when it's at the center here. I can hear myself just fine, but for some reason, when the subject is in front of me, I need to push this out this way or it's just too quiet. You have a gain boost right here, wind noise filter. Can control for white balance, manual focus, exposure compensation, ISO, shutter speed, auto exposure lock. This is just incredible, the settings that we have here. 
So absolutely incredible. This is the camera that I would be carrying around in my pocket, just frankly for the amount of controls that we have here. Now starting with looking at pictures, I see the same photo goodness as the G4 as far as I could see in pictures, but also like the G4, I still see issues with overexposure and blowing out highlights, though using HDR does recover highlights in most circumstances. I also see quite a bit of noise reduction, which leaves images looking like they're lacking detail when you zoom in. This is especially true of foliage, trees, and grass. I also notice over sharpening of the images as well, though this tends to not bother me unless looking at the photos in the gallery since LG applies more sharpening to the images inside of that application. I do like the color processing of the photos though. I think the V10 does a great job at producing natural colors and I feel comfortable using this as my main camera. I was able to go out in multiple situations and get nice results due to having many options with the automatic and manual modes. Also, the shallow depth of field looks gorgeous for macro shots. The background looks very nice and blurred. It doesn't look artificial. I was very impressed with the G4 in this way as well. This camera does well in low light due to optical image stabilization and also the f1.8 aperture lens. Low light performance is also very much augmented by using manual controls and a tripod to get some pretty impressive results. Video has been a joy so long as I am shooting in 4K at the highest bit rate and then downsampling to 1080p. This is where an SD card slot comes in handy. Tells me, so this is 30 frames per second, Ultra HD at 64 megabits per second. It should be impressive, although I do worry about how much sharpening there is and how it will do with the exposure. Huh, John? What do you think about all that? Sharpening the exposure? <laughs> yes. <laughs> over sharpening and over exposure. Hunting. It's supposed to make a sound. I think. <laughs> Probably been pressed a couple hundred times though. Let's see it. You can just see these. These ones right down. Say. They make nice too. Oh. Yoshi. Link. Comes to town, comes to save the princess Zelda. Zelda. <laughs> I will always love Zelda, seriously. 1080p natively shot from this camera looks to be incredibly over sharpened. That's very unfortunate. I really can't stand the way that it looks, the way that it makes skin look just too over sharpened. see some hunting a little bit. Huh. Now this doesn't have optical image stabilization at all. There we go. This is optical image stabilization without the digital image stabilization. Hunting a little bit. So 4K is the way to go, or downsampling to 1080p is the way to go. Unfortunately, steady mode doesn't work with 4K, 
I wish it did because I find the steady mode to be quite impressive. It mixes optical image stabilization and the digital image stabilization together. It does crop the image a little bit, but I do like how nice and steady it looks. Having real-time controls for video is just really awesome because I see that this camera tends to overexpose the image. It doesn't always get the white balance right, but you can change those yourself. Just knocking down the exposure compensation a notch or two really helps with the overexposure issues. All in all, this is a great camera and I think this is one that I'd like to keep in my pocket for quite some time. So thank you everybody for watching. This has been Erica, the technology nerd who likes to film stuff. Please rate, comment, and subscribe. Let me know what you think about this phone. If you would like to switch out your LG G4, for example, for the V10. This is a phone that's definitely in my top five for the year. I have really enjoyed the experience that it gives. This is a very strong multimedia contender, although the display is not the best calibrated, although it is nice and big and gets pretty bright. This phone feels great in the hand. You have the ability to unlock it with the fingerprint, so it's nice and updated like a lot of the other flagships that are being released. Most awesomely, you could remove the back. You have access to an SD card slot, and also you can take an extra battery with you. Great manual controls on the camera. So this phone has just been a lot of fun. So let me know what you all think. So again, thank you everyone for watching. Leave your comments in the comment section below, and good night.